Good morning. My name is Faith Gay. I'm the associate pastor here at First Pres. Um, stepping in for a couple of weeks while our beloved Jess takes a well-deserved, well-deserved vacation. Um, we welcome you this morning, whether you're in person, uh, online, sitting outside, trying to decide if you want to come in or not, um, whether you're going to listen later in the week uh, during a break on a shift, uh, whether you've been here forever, whether you're here for a first time, whether it's something in between, whether your old friends we're welcoming who are coming in the door right now who we've missed very much. Hi, Sebastiani. Hi. Um, we're so, so glad to have you here. Our hearts are always open. Our arms are open. We are here for you. And uh, as we like to say, and we really mean it, we are not a Sunday morning kind of church. We do seem to be a right-sided church as opposed to the left side today. I don't know what's going on with that. But, uh, but we have lots of things going on in this community and in the world, in our interfaith work. And we would welcome participation, small, large, whatever you can do. So first things first, what's the news of the community? Good morning. Good morning. Um, this is Communion Sunday, and we serve it by intention. So um, folks will be coming from the side aisles down up through the front and then return back by side. Um, if you are not able to make it up to the communion table, our two servers, Ann and, um, excuse me, Sue and John, will serve you. So just let them know just by, you know, a little sign, and they will bring communion to you. Thank you. And communion, like all important meals, and it is, of course, the most important one, is often messy, often intimate, so just be patient with us, and we will come to you. John? This has not been a particularly uh, good summer for local churches. First, we had the tornado in Rome that did some damage up there, but then this last week, right here in Cooperstown, the parsonage of the Baptist Church caught on fire and a uh, considerable amount of damage and uh, loss there for both the structure, I believe, and so also uh, Pastor Mike's uh, belongings. So the session has uh, decided to, if, if we would like to help them out, some financially, uh, we're uh, taking up a collection for them with our r r normal collection. If you wish to write a check to the First Presbyterian Church here and then put on the memo line, Baptist Fire or, or Deacons, because it'll go through the Deacons uh, uh, Fund, Deacons, Baptist Fire, we will then uh, get that money to the our friends, co-religionists down the street here to uh, help whatever they, however they want that money to be used to uh, restore their property and belongings. If you don't have a check with you, you can just fill out an envelope uh, in the pew there, put some cash in there and say uh, uh, Baptist Fire and uh, that'll do the trick as well. So. Uh, this will probably go on for a few weeks uh, if, if you're out of, out of money at <laughs> being the first of the month or thereabouts. Uh, so it, uh, we'll be doing this for a few weeks before we, send, we talk to the Baptists and send the funds to them. But uh, uh, this is one way we can help out our, our fellow uh, uh, Christians here and, and, and co-religionists here in, in Cooperstown. So uh, if you wish, please do so. You know, that's exactly right. And I would say, if you see Pastor Mike, give him a huge hug. I think it was a super harrowing experience. Um, he lost two of his pets. He was able to get out of a window. He's doing fine. He's great. But just, you know, this is a, definitely a time that we can show our love for our great friends down the street. Um, along those same lines, the First Baptist Church is uh, undertaking a Puerto Rico mission trip. Uh, Cindy Falk is leaving on Saturday, I think, um, and that's to help with past hurricane damage and hurricane preparedness. Uh, there's lots of ways to contribute. I think the best thing right now are gift cards from Home Depot, Walgreens, and Walmart, uh, or you can write a check to FBC, but that's happening right away. 
Um, also, you know, as, as mentioned, we are still trying to help out our great friends in Rome, uh, and there's lots of ways to help there, too. If you have any questions about any of this, uh, just track me down after the service, and I'll give you more details. Um, we're also especially glad this morning that we have Dr. Richard Sternberg with us. He worships with us on occasion, really happy that he's here today. He was just elected president of the Oneonta Jewish Community, uh, Temple Beth El, and Richard is very keen, as he always has been, to reach out to other communities of faith, uh, ours being one that has very much welcomed this uh, connection. And so um, please speak to Richard afterwards. And along those same lines, I should also mention that next week is the annual visit of Rabbi Sharon Kleinbaum, who's been here many times in our pulpit. And we are honored that she'll share her many gifts with us. Um, I'm trying to get the word out on that because she's definitely someone that I, I don't like to miss. And I think you'll find the same to be true. And finally, and most importantly for today, welcome. I welcome Evan Lesdowski from the Glimmerglass Festival. He's going to share his witness with us this morning. And we're really, really glad that you're here and that we'll have someone singing on key up here in the front. So that would be fantastic. So let's now turn our hearts and minds to worship. Good morning. We do not live by bread alone, but by the word which became flesh and dwells among us. Christ is the true bread of heaven, the manna of freedom. And now if you are able, please stand and sing our first hymn, number 792, There is a Balm in Gilead. <laughs>
God has given us a sign showing that love is stronger than death. The sign of the cross points to our exodus from the bondage of sin. Let us seek God's forgiveness and enter into new life in Christ. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Holy One, whose love and justice condemn us, whose mercy and kindness feed us, we confess our sins and pray for forgiveness. What terrible suffering we have unleashed. We have used other persons without regard for their dignity. We have abused the earth without care for its beauty. We have ignored the future life of this planet, our home. God, change us. Free us from captivity to our selfishness. Bind us to each other, the whole body of Christ. Let us bear witness that your love holds us together in perfect unity. We pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God assures us that we need not fear our hunger. Believe the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And now, if you would take this moment to share the peace. The peace of God be with you always. And also with you. Please stand if you are able and willing and share peace with your neighbors. (laughs) Thank you, Evan. That was amazing. Creator of unity, body of peace, spirit of community, 
Bind us together as we break open your word together. Amen. Exodus. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them whether they will follow my instructions or not. Then Moses said to Aaron, say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on this ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. And let us say, amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Yet he commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven. He rained down on them manna to eat and gave them the grain of heaven. Mortals ate of the bread of angels he sent them food in abundance. He caused the east wind to blow in the heavens, and by his power he let out the south wind. He rained flesh upon them like dust, winged birds like the sand of the seas. He let them fall within their camp all around their dwellings, and they ate and were well filled, for he gave them what they craved. Our last reading is from Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, and 14 through 16. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beg you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is but one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. We must no longer be children, tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. And now we'll stand, if you are able, and sing verse 1 of hymn 834, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. <laughs>
I know the bulletin says stand up, but I think be seated. It's hot, and this is a long passage, so please be seated. <laughs> so this is the New Testament version, the line from Aaron and Moses and the manna of heaven over to the New Testament, uh, sort of the follow-up from loaves and fishes, from picking up from last week. This is John 6, 24 to 35. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, very truly, I tell you, you were looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves and fishes. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that, e that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? And Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who was sent. So they said to him, What signs are you going to give us? so that we may see it and believe you. What works are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, Give us that bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The Gospel of the Lord for the people of God. So please rise if you're able and sing the last verse of Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Same hymn number, 834. seated. So before we talk about the Israelites, before we sort of imagine that they too could be singing this song because they were stuck in the wilderness, let's stop for just a moment and think about the fact that this has been a seriously joyful week. And if you miss it, I'm going to tell you why. Um, Pastor Mike, of course, is safe. It was truly scary, but he is safe and thriving. And then, in terms of amazing witness this week, I don't know if you had a chance to see any of it, but the witness, the grit, the grace of the athletes all over the world in the Olympics, you know, it's often, always, perhaps, a hugely joyful event that transcends national boundaries and loyalties. This year, it gave us a little bit of a respite from wars all over the world. Uh, and it even you know, transcends winning and losing. Uh, yesterday, I happened to catch on the radio, I guess yesterday, day before yesterday, um, Dominica and St. Lucia had never won a single medal in the history of the Olympics. And they both won within like, I don't know, an hour or two of each other, at least as it was reported. And there were pictures all over the Olympic Village of people jumping up and down. And they were more people than were in Dominica and St. Lucia. <laughs> and it was... It was truly a great moment. And some of the athletes were interviewed, and there's a bunch of countries, mostly new countries, not rich countries, young countries, that have never won an Olympic medal. And you could see you know, the dominant nations. This was a safe space for them to be incredibly generous. And it was a beautiful thing. 
And one thing I would mention to you, the part of the Olympics that is the Paralympics starts on August 30th. And if you have any doubt, any doubt about the magnificence of all of God's creatures, watch that for an hour and your doubts will be erased forever, I guarantee you. Um, and then, of course, this week there was the intense joy of seeing the American journalist Evan Gerskovich and other political prisoners jump off the Army transport plane, get a hug from various political officials, including, I think, the president, and coming back into freedom as part of this epic 24-person prisoner swap, uh, the biggest one since, I believe, the Cold War. And in Evan's case, he lost no time lifting his mom, like hoisting her in the air with a bear hug to last for the ages. And for just a moment, a tiny, tiny moment, the constant headlines of battling nations took a back seat to these riveting human stories of release from bondage into freedom. Uh, Evans' courageous reporting and intense interest in freeing other political prisoners no matter what they are in for, is something that I think we can all be justly proud of, and all the other folks uh, who came home to us. On the U.S. side of the deal, you probably saw, you know, kids jumping up and down, seeing parents they were not sure they would ever see again. And on the Russian side, it was super interesting. Uh, there were two young girls, I mean, I think a boy and a girl, beautiful kids, landed in Moscow who seemed not to know that they were Russians at all. Uh, they, maybe their parents were under, undercover operatives, I don't know. But on the plane to Moscow, they found out they had this fundamental connection to Russia for the very first time, and their parents, too, were coming out of captivity. And this look of wonder, not so much fear, but wonder on their faces was something, you know, to think about. And I guess, at least for me, I have to wonder what's ahead for all these personal stories. Is their newfound freedom as giddy and as mind-blowing as I would think it would be? Will all life going forward be, you know, full of joy, eating ice cream for a living? I mean, I don't know. But, but you, have, you have to wonder. And, you know, it's interesting, both President Putin and President Biden celebrated in ways that were, of course, theatrical and for the world stage, but also seemed like they were sincere. Biden, who was a great hugger, pulled all these people off the plane and tried to hug each one, and he, you know, got most of them. And Putin, on the other hand, was waiting by the plane with flowers for these children and their parents, and also, I'm sure, for other folks, maybe with less stellar resumes, but still, he was there and it clearly was pleased and moved and proud to have his heroes back home. Um, I don't think there was any question there were honest feelings on display. No one doubts that Putin loves his homeland and wants to make it great again. Uh, Jake Sullivan, who is our national security advisor, and he is not a person known for emotion, was so choked up that he had trouble speaking when all this was going on. Everyone in this drama, was living out very powerful motifs of freeing the captive, of returning citizens to their dignity, of providing the protection of very powerful national forces. Today's Old and New Testament lessons, and maybe especially the Old Testament, are a very deep meditation on these same timeless themes. What allows us to really be free? How much protection do we really need? What empire, if any, do we want to belong to? And the answer, of course, comes in part from the collective needs of a people. In the Old Testament, kind of going back before what Richard read and what Miles read, before we get to this time of exodus that's part of our lectionary today, we have the Israelites who are featured so prominently in the amazing book of Genesis. And the perception of God, and I'm there's sure many people can correct me on this, but my perception when I read Genesis, which I think is one of the most beautiful books ever, is that the Israelites were worshiping a God for them that was all about food and fertility, healthy children to work in the fields, 
having enough children to work in the fields, having enough food on the table, no childless cat ladies in Genesis. But, but the worship of God by the Israelites in Genesis finds just this huge focus in baseline needs that we still need, which is keeping people fed. By the time we get to today's passage in Exodus, and Richard, I think you know that we follow a lectionary. So it's not like I plucked that out just because I was hoping you would come and read it, but thank you. Uh, But by the time we get to Exodus, the most pressing issue is no longer food. The Israelites do not have a rumbling stomach. They don't have unplowed fields. They don't have empty bowls. In fact, they say in this passage, they talk about the richness of being in captivity in Egypt. They are longing for the huge amounts of meat and bread. Their most pressing issue at this point in time was getting away from bondage, getting away from being second class, getting away from not having their voices heard, not having their children in danger. They wanted not to be slaves in Egypt. But at the same time, They were slaves to the dazzling pharaohs, the incredibly dazzling pharaohs. And they had plenty to eat, and they could see it was a civilization that was admirable. So Exodus Exodus tells us that first, the Israelites say, God, make me free. My stomach is full, but I need to be free. I need to be free. They beg God for release, and sure enough, their wish, their desire, their heartfelt prayer was granted. But unfortunately, the Israelites' freedom, similar to today's migration patterns, very similar, led the Israelis directly into a barren, bleak, scary, hot desert. Not the sort of soft-focused paradise we think of when we think about the freedom of what we think of as freedom, you know, consumer choices, individual rights. That's not what their freedom was. So while the Israelites were both free, they were out of captivity, and they were victors, As far as I can tell, the Pharaoh's chariots were either face up or face down on the Red Sea. But the most pressing issue went back to that Genesis issue. They needed their god of food. The warrior god praying to Yahweh, who's most famously rumbles, I will be what I will be, was not what they needed at that moment. They needed to go back to El Shaddai, the Genesis version, the God of food, the God of fundamental human needs. Now, I think most of us, uh, whether we are Baptist in our hearts or something else, know the story of manna from heaven. It's, you know, we use it as a shorthand now for any miraculous, hard, hard to explain, happy, much needed, can't get it for ourselves gift. And when I say you can't get it for ourselves, I don't mean that, you know, Taylor Swift tickets drop into your teenager's laps. I mean a gift that is much needed in a time of crisis. The Old Testament story, as you pick up from both the Old Testament readings, is told in really desperate circumstances. In a stark wilderness that makes the newly freed Israelites all look back with longing on their life in captivity. They wanted the grand kingdom of the pharaohs, where there were pots of of, of meat and bread for all. So all of a sudden for them, freedom was just an idea, just a word, nothing left to lose, to use a famous phrase. And the certainty of square meals in captivity looked like the biggest lost opportunity they could imagine. These Israelites had come to terms with living in a kind of luxurious captivity. They had made peace with their wealthy captors. Like us, they had found economic, cultural, other activities with the dominant person, the pharaoh. They had come to terms with bargaining as a way of life. They worked at this to earn that. They bargained for this to get that. And it ended up being an early version of the rat race because they had to stay in favor to get goods. They had to work harder and harder to get to the concentration of wealth at the top of the pharaoh's kingdom. So these scared Israelites out in the desert, and I don't know if this rings true for you right now, but it certainly rings true for me, the ones who wanted to go back to Egypt to undo that plea to God for freedom were willing not to pay attention to who feeds them, who leads them, as long as they get fed. And this makes a heck of a lot of sense. I think I would have felt the same way. They were hungry, lost, tired. They were afraid they were going to die. 
and they were afraid they were going to die for a very good reason. So they had gone from one challenge straight to another. Their first task was getting brave enough to leave and to seize freedom. The second was believing in sticking by the reason they left, to live the free life they wanted, to shake their own lives, not begging and scraping before their captors. So freedom caused them huge problems, always does, and made them super uncomfortable. They lost their creature comforts, which, by the way, is the best argument the world over, and I don't mean just today, forever, by dictators who want to tell us that bondage is OK because it makes our lives easier. Now, the religious tension between the security of bondage and the stress of freedom may not be quite so far away from this particular Sunday morning in Cooperstown for all of us overstuffed types as we think. In Pharaoh's world, and in the world, of course, our American market, uh, everything is part of a bargain. Everything's measured and weighed and calculated and recorded. We deeply resent the notion that anyone, anyone should get anything free. Anyone. Especially the undeserving, those who haven't earned their keep, those who have not been with us forever. We grow a custom we have accepted, and I should stop for a second and say, I actually think this congregation does a good job with all these things, but I want us to think about it for a second since this is our lectionary. We've grown, you know, we've grown very you know, accepting of the sort of a soul-crushing way of life for everyone, where it's a zero-sum game. Too much rush, too much stuff, too many emails, too much scheduled time, too many text messages. We're so busy serving the gods of the market, our secular world, that we don't stop to ask why, which gets asked in the Old Testament and gets asked in the New Testament, why we spend so much of our precious time that God gave us in ways that just do not nourish us. Why do we labor for things that don't satisfy? And the answer is because we have accepted, like the Israelites wanted to, the bargain of empire. We embrace this life that eats away at what God has given us. It's a life, really, of coercion. Um, think about this for a second. The psalmist asks over and over again, why do we live the way we live? And you could translate it to, why do we have overpacked days and sleepless nights? Sleep deprivation in this country is a shorthand for a life without spontaneity and a life without appreciation of everything we see right in front of us. One of my best friends uh, during COVID, at the beginning of COVID, before vaccines, told me secretly late one night when we were all stuck at home and talking on the phone that she was so grateful, so grateful for COVID, even if it might kill her because it was the only way she could figure out to take a time out from the competitive rat race that is our life. It's the only way she could get out of bondage, see her children. It's the only way she could actually spend time with her husband. She called it the miracle. She called COVID the pandemic a miracle. And she felt it was a matter of God's grace. I think she recognized that she was a middle class person and that was not everyone's experience or anywhere close to it. But the point being, she somehow felt powerless to, to take a step aside, but for a shutdown of the entire world as we know it. And think about our kids, uh, the kids inside of each of us. And I don't mean just our biological kids, because we are responsible for everybody. We stick them on a fast track, because we're so afraid if we don't, other kids will get ahead. And our children and our grandchildren see this. They're not stupid. They have a better BS detector than we do. They know how, they see how we are living our lives. And they either replicate them or they don't, but they see this. So I think it's not wrong to say that often, maybe not all the time, maybe not everybody in this room who does such a good job at community, as you all do, truly, but we all experience a kind of bondage that it's not all that unlike what the Israelites were saying to Moses and Aaron. They're saying, get me back to my creature comforts. But one thing that did happen to the Israelites is that it slacked up their faith. 
they were so busy with their devotion and attention to the world of the pharaohs, again, with good reason, that their attention to a spiritual life, to what is important to their souls, slacked off. Their physical health diminished. Their relationships with others, the very thing that kept them alive and keeps us alive, took a back seat. So the whole story in a microcosm that we heard today is the high cost and high reward of walking away from these chains, these comfortable chains that bind us. The high cost of breaking our addiction to competition. The high cost of saying, okay, I live in this world, but I am not buying into it. It is not a zero sum game. I am not gonna hoard more than I need. I am not gonna take more than my share of goods. I'm not gonna put a wall with my neighbor to make sure my neighbor knows what I have and they do not. But the thing about this too is that the high cost of breaking this addiction has a high reward. It keeps us from being eaten up bit by bit with tasks that don't need doing if we trust that God will take care of us. So one interesting thing, if you read the manna from heaven story, and I will say, and I'm not the only one to say this, I, I think Barbara Brown Taylor says this, and many Southerners, I always growing up secretly thought manna was grits, because that's what, it was in the South, and we had grits, you know, we had hot grits, cold grits, black grits, red grits, whatever, and it felt to me like this, these must be grits, but whatever it was, there was a lesson being taught about community in this manna story that you know, when it comes up in the lectionary, we think, I know that story. So interestingly about manna was a couple of things. God gave it to them. It wasn't, you know, a Michelin-rated meal. It was not a five-star restaurant, but it kept them alive. But several things were super fascinating. I mean, there's been debates forever about what manna really is, and it's, it's not grits. But the idea that manna would not keep overnight, so you couldn't hoard it. So everyone got a portion every day, and they had to come back and get it, that same portion, the next day. And of course, in a rule that we ignore now, the only exception to that was the Sabbath. So God meant the people to rest for a day. God let them gather twice as much the day before to last them for two days, and made it clear that the seventh day, not just an hour, not just the morning, that the day was to rest. So they had this freedom, this restricted freedom. Everybody had the same amount of food. You couldn't do, do it in advance. You couldn't barter it with each other. They lived one day at a time. Imagine that, one day at a time, not worrying about your retirement account, not saving for tuition, not figuring out if you can have a different kind of house. They lived that way, as we know, for 40 years, 14,600 days. And can you imagine what happened at that time? Well, we have sort of a historical record that is pretty important. The Israelites deepen their bond, of course, with God, and they deepen their bond as a people. They could focus on family, on community, on each developing their unique gifts, and they had leisure together in community. They sang the Psalms loudly. Uh, I mean, interestingly, uh, the the, the, the Zion selection this morning comes from an old Appalachian folk hymn that out of a tradition of singing loudly as a group for hours on end, this is what the Israelites did. They prayed together, they formed a bond, they had a basis of generosity to practice with each other. They took the time to intentionally be together. So of course there's a point to the story which is pretty obvious, which is Pharaoh is not just a docudrama about a long dead luxurious kingdom. It's everything that traps us and keeps us down and drawn into a system that lets us trade every bit of freedom we have for the unhappiness and loneliness of merely consumer lives. Everyone, everyone here is thirsty and hungry for something deeper and has an unsatisfied longing. But I'm telling you, there's nothing in this world, there's nothing in this secular world that can give you what you want because it's simply not for sale. So we have this thing, we wanna live gospel lives. We wanna be generous because God has been generous to us and live that generosity towards our neighbors. On the other hand, that desire gets overpowered by our desires to be somebody in a competitive economy. 
we know what the Israelites were tempted by to go back to Egypt. But we also know right now that our world and our environment is perishing in an epidemic of fear, selfishness, loneliness, anxiety, greed, violence, all those things we know. And it need not be so. And we begin to make that change in this very warm room, so I'm going to wrap up right now. God's way is to seek what satisfies deeply, what fills our, ourselves as children of the gospel, and to find that in the act of constant giving till it hurts. Rather than constant taking, we find, we find our true calling. Again, it's not difficult to see the line that goes from the Old Testament, which is from Moses and manna, to Jesus on that hillside, responding to the worried crowd who were uptight and wanted food. The bread of life Jesus offered, and it's over and above manna when you get to the New Testament, is a very hard road of freedom. It's an invitation to get off the rat wheel, to quit our hoarding, to keep drawing lines between us and them, scary, hard as that might be. So when we celebrate communion today, we enter the sacred acting out of our conviction that only broken and shared bread feeds us only wine drunk totally communally in the ultimate act of sharing and giving to each other can ever satisfy us. Amen. Let us now give as much as we can. Let's give more than we can as our act of commitment and love for each other.
Please be seated. Will you pray with me? Loving God, as you fed your people in the wilderness, as you showed what was really important in terms of nourishment, use our gifts, our time, and talents as the manna to meet the hungers of the world in which we live. Show us the way, show us how to give. For Jesus' sake, amen. What are our joys and concerns today to share with others? Thank you to everyone who shared cards, emails, texts, flowers, baked goods, <laughs> and other gifts uh, with me during my recovery from kidney stone surgery. Thank you also for the many prayers. I felt big hugs emanating from this special place, and I truly am grateful. Thank you. So I have a, a couple to share. Um, first of all, huge gratitude for Senator Seward's life. Um, continued prayers for Tanette and Adrian Kosminski. Um, special joy of having Sebastiani with us this morning. And I should add a special joy to have uh, the middle child, the middle son of my great friend Terry here with us. Miles Makovsky, who I'm thrilled to have join us. Will you pray with me? Oh God, we pray for this community, for our greater families, our individuals, our children. We pray especially for the family of Senator Seward. We are grateful for his life and service, and we keep in prayer to net and Adrian Kosminski. We pray for the nations of the earth and that the world may know plenty and peace. We pray for those who hunger for bread and those who hunger for righteousness, that they will be fed what they need. Help us serve in that mighty objective. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be the bread for the world. Amen. Thank you. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Blessed are you, our God. You have heard the voices of those who cry out to you. In your mercy, you save your people from all iniquities. In you, we have hope, for your steadfast love endures forever. Therefore, we praise you, joining the song of the universal church and the heavenly choir. Holy, 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 God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus came into this world to pattern God's will for our lives. When he was disparaged and belittled, he continued to call for unity in the family of faith. In the night when he was betrayed, after he gave thanks, he took bread and broke it and said, 
this is my body, which is broken for you. And after the meal, he took the cup and he said, this is the covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Please pray with me. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this bread and cup. Make us one in the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Through your Spirit, renew us day by day. Send us out to speak your grace to all people, inviting them to join the beloved community. Through Jesus Christ, in the unity of the Spirit. Amen.
join me in the prayer after communion in your bulletin. Holy Spirit, you have filled us with your life. Christ our Savior, you have embraced us in your love. God our Mother, you have fed us with your grace. Now send us out into your glorious world to share the mercy of your life, your love, your grace with all. Amen. Our last hymn is number 656. We've come this far by faith. There's only one verse. And if, you'd sit, if you would rise, if you're able. So go now, make a big break for freedom. The worries of the world, the measures of success, who cares? What we care about is depth, love for each other, our relationship with God, this community, and the community of all the beloved, which includes the whole world. Amen.